Good evening, everybody, and thank you for attending. My name is Graham Wetzbarger. I am the Vice President of Technology at Costume Society of America, as well as the Acting Editor in Conversations on Dress. Um, without further ado, I would like to begin by introducing our panelists um, in alphabetical order. First, we have Kimberly Christman Chaplin, Chapel. If you'll please turn on your camera, Kimberly, and we can all get to know you. Uh, Kimberly is a fashion historian, curator, lecturer, critic, and journalist based in Los Angeles, where she is currently a USC Libraries Fellow. Her first book, Fashion Victims, Dress of the Court of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, was published in 2015 and won the CSA's Milia Davenport Publication Award. Her 2022 book, Red, White, and Blue on the Runway, um, has just been published by CSA series at Kent University Press. And in Kimberly's newest book, Skirts, published by Macmillan, she discusses 20th century fashion evolution through iconic garments, including the 1962 Happy Birthday, Mr. President gown. Kimberly, what about the objects that we're talking about tonight, the event we're talking about tonight, or the topic we're talking about tonight um, really connects with you? Well, I've written about this dress in two of my books. Uh, it's a pretty major dress. However, when I saw Kim Kardashian step onto the runway wearing it, I did not recognize it. Uh, it was only because Vogue tweeted at the exact moment that she stepped onto the, run, uh, the red carpet that I even knew what she was wearing. And I, I think that's, that says a lot about um, the dress itself. Uh, sometimes the woman makes the dress. Uh, but also, of course, when I found this out, I was completely horrified uh, for reasons that we're all going to be talking about tonight. Uh, I saw it as a a teachable moment, um, both for the public. I was interviewed a lot about this. I tweeted about it a lot, uh, but it was also a teachable moment for me because I learned a lot about what, uh, you know, general audiences and, and Twitterers and members of the public uh, think about historic dress and what they think goes on in museums, which isn't necessarily what actually goes on in museums. Yeah. I mean, when I saw her watching it live, I was like, her breasts are so like 60s. And that was my first connection with this must be another vintage piece. And then I think, I'm not sure which channel I was watching, but I think they announced it during the time. And I also thought, what is this terrible faux fur or vintage fur thing she's wearing? That doesn't seem very on brand, but we'll get to all that later. Thank you, Kimberly. And we'll move on to introducing our next presenter. Kevin Jones comes to us from FID Museum and Galleries. Um, and the uh, in downtown Los Angeles, and he's been collection manager there since 1999. Appointed curator in 2002, his fashion and social expertise encompassed the 19th and 20th centuries with an emphasis on haute couture. His diverse exhibition topics cover Hollywood to high fashion. In 2021, Jones curated the exhibition and catalog Sporting Fashion, as seen on the screen. Um, Outdoor Girl, 1800 to 1960, winner of the CSA Amelia Davenport Publication Award, and is currently on a three-year nationwide tour. Well, the Fitta Museum has become very well known over the last three decades for its uh, Hollywood costume exhibition. And, you know, everything uh, is on loan to the museum, uh, and we don't own any of those pieces. And so Hollywood is kind of surrounds me all the time. And most of the time it is garments that are worn in the movies versus the celebrities. But there is that crossover that also happens. Additionally, um, I was called as a consultant about two months before the, um, the, uh, the Met Gala with a question about wearing Marilyn Monroe's dress, not Kevin wearing Marilyn Monroe's dress, <laughs> but a celebrity and what I thought about that. And um, so I gave my, my ideas about how that's really not a great idea. At the time we were not uh, given the, the name of that celebrity, but um, Kim Kardashian's name was bandied around as the possible uh, candidate. So, um, can I ask what your, your, besides not a good idea, did you present like a written thing? Was it just a phone call? Did you think it was going to happen after you ended that conversation? It was a phone call it, there and it was kind of off the record at the time because of course nobody knew anything was going to happen. 
so there was no point of a record. Uh, and it was more being horrified of even the idea of something like this happening. Um, so when, and, and we did not know if it would happen. It, you know, this was just a, a, a question mark. It was just sure. gathering information and which I thought, okay, well at least the persons that own the dress are seeking information or people connected to the dress are seeking information. You know, is this a possibly a good idea? Could it damage the dress? You know, what, what could happen? And, sure. um, you know, they were given information from professionals um, that was sound advice, you know, uh, but again, something like this is outside of the general museum um, um, purview because it's not owned by a public collection. You know, when we borrow garments uh, for our Hollywood costume shows, when they enter our museum, uh, they are treated as museum artifacts. Once they leave our galleries, they go sometimes go back on set or they go into an archive or they go back to whoever owns them. And often it's the rental galleries and they could be rented again for other movies. They are not treated as museum objects. So it's this strange kind of world that I live in where many of the things that we borrow into the museum field and exit the museum field very quickly. Um, and you know, in a garment like this, everybody may think, oh, that should be in a museum, but it's not, you know, it's owned privately and uh, it again also can move around into different spaces for different reasons. Yeah, and we'll definitely talk more about that later and the, um, you know, the dichotomy between public, private, and non-museum institutions. Thank you for joining us, Kevin. Next, we have Catherine Hill McIntyre, who is a museum's collection consultant in the Washington, D.C. area and co-principal of Blue <laughs> Box it's an Consultants, LLC. <laughs> uh, providing archive and cultural heritage collection management, custom storage solutions for clothing and textiles, and exhibition preparation. Working in the museum field since 1999, D.C., Atlanta, and New York, her extensive experience includes managing library, photograph archives, historic houses, garment collections, decorative arts, revolutionary and Civil War firearms and armaments. She is also the co-founder of the Facebook page Fashion Historians Unite, who I imagine <laughs> many of our viewers are members of and if you're not you should join as i recently did and um the uh the content's wonderful uh welcome catherine um, Thanks, how man. are you connected with this um this whole thing well having worked in museum collections for such a long time and various types of objects and scenarios throughout, you know, working in historic homes and also museums, um, you see a lot of different codes of ethics or th the way that people manage their collections. Um, but no matter what, we're stewards of the objects and we care for the objects when they come into the museum, no matter what, and we don't lend them out to people for use. So this really struck a chord with me when, you know, it took, I when I saw what was happening, in at the moment i was looking into it and i realized okay well ripley's is not a accredited museum so i can see where something like this would be allowed to happen so we can get upset about it to an extent but at the same time if they're not following the same codes that we are there's only a um there's only a, a certain amount of upset we're allowed to have because we have no control from that side of things so it just really um really upset me to see something that was such it was an object of a moment of a particular moment in history that was being treated as something um something like a uh, just something she could parade around in and and get attention from so it was um that's her job though right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's like that it was just it, here. <laughs> it was just very upsetting to me and having done all of the hard work to try to protect objects all of these years and to see something as important as that paraded around like that was really upsetting to yeah. our community. Yeah. And we're very passionate oh, about sure. what we do. And one of the first conversations I know about this started on Fashion Historians Unite. There was there was a lot of buzz from that community. Yeah. And um, you know, that may have indirectly spurred uh, you know, this webinar tonight. So thank you for providing a platform for both scholars and yeah. I'm not a scholar. I'm an amateur to uh, to discuss these things. It's really, um, it's really great to have you here tonight. 
um, Deborah Miller, our next panelist, uh, because Deborah is a leading expert appraiser of couture, vintage fashion, and textiles. Her clothing and fabric appraisals have been showcased on PBS's Antique Roadshow, the very first place I ever saw her, and inspired me to get my own appraisals uh, membership, appraisers membership, and certifications of US, UPAP. USPAP. Um, her clients include universities, charitable institutions, and private donors to museums, such as the Met, uh, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, LACMA, Royal Ontario Museum, FIT Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, and there's a whole other list. Um, uh, my Neighbor Drexel, um, My Neighbor Baltimore Museum of Art, um, Philadelphia Museum of Art, My Other Neighbor, uh, all on here as well. Deborah is a member of the American Society of Appraisers. I believe she's a certified uh, our specialist appraiser there, if I'm looking, um, as well as a member of the International Society of Appraisers. Um, and you can catch her this season on the new episode of Antique Roadshow. Uh, welcome, Deborah. <laughs> thank you. Don't you. Need a plug from me. Thank, but... thank you, Graham. My mother thanks you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm super glad to be here. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'm a personal property appraiser uh, uh, for costumes and fashion. I'm a senior appraiser um, with that designation in ASA. And my job is valuation. So my, even though I'm, uh, you know, full of a lot of opinions, as my family knows, my professional opinion of value is not based on my personal opinion of an item or any moral judgment as to where it's worn, who's wearing it, what they do. My value conclusions are like based on researching the market and what the market reacts to. And the market is basically just the pool of buyers. That's what we call the people who are interested. We like raise their hand. Um, and, um, you know, as an appraiser, I've really learned to be dispassionate in my assessment of, of property and objective in just breaking down what we call are the tangible and intangible aspects uh, that are important to buyers. And I do this by watching and tracking, you know, how they're reacting to the market, what they're buying, um, you know, buying trends, and then talking to people as well. Um, I was certainly interested in the debate and the passion with which the public was engaged. Um, and it basically, it's the exact desired outcome of that Kim Kardashian and Ripley's wanted. So they, they got what they wanted, um, a lot of buzz, a lot of talk, um, and they both knew they were going to take a lot of heat for this. Um, and I think it was just a calculated risk um, they're willing to take. The audience wants to know everyone's connection to this. And we will ask you more questions about appraisal, about um, value and, and how it can fluctuate and, and about the whole um, stunt that it was. Thank you for joining us tonight. Elise Yvonne Rousseau, who is a conservator in San Francisco. She received her MSc at the Institut Royal de Patrimoine Artistique, Cultural Heritage in Brussels, Belgium. Thank God I took high school French. Um, and undertook po further postgraduate textile disciplines at the uh -oh, uh, Karl Rusch Archdiocese Tusch de Kunst in um, Ettlingham, Germany. I never took German. Uh, she also has an MA in museum studies, postgraduate credits focused on my in 1999, she established her atelier on conservation de rigueur at Exoria Abatement Solutions, now simply ACDR Fuf, um, in San Francisco, and specializes in textiles, paintings, historic objects, decorative arts, books, and paper. Um, these are several images of her and her team working on restoring historic couture, historic costumes, etc. Um, Elise, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And um, I'm going to throw that same question at you. As a conservator, how are you connected with this whole episode? Well, I think um, gobsmacked initially. I, I think I thought um, before it really came to light in the moment that it wasn't the actual dress, I, I thought, well, for sure, that has to be a replica. Um, you know, a copy of the dress rather than actually wearing the dress. So once the revelation of the fact that it is the dress was being worn out in public, I, you know, that just goes against the grain of 
all of my years of training and practice, the, all the codes of ethics, whether you're a member of ARCS or AIC or ICOM or any other museum professional organization, you know, that has a very well thought out um, code of ethics of how we approach the work we do and, and what kind of care we give to objects. I and mean, I think Catherine spoke to these um, same ideals and it's very important. I mean, I do work with private clients all the time and a big part of my job is in any project to educate and explain, you know, as a steward of an object in a private collection, it, it is your responsibility to take good care of it so that the next steward that comes along, um, you know, receives it in good condition. And um, there are, you know, many things we can do to stabilize objects. And we can talk about this as we get into the discussion. But, um, you know, once damage is done, it, it's pretty irreversible. You can do things to mend and repair and conceal um, aesthetically and try to stabilize an object. But, um, you know, the kind it's of still damage. damage with this dress or the back end and the zipper area just kind of got blown out that can be stabilized but it'll never be the same dress again and yeah it's the same with a piece of art you know if it gets a cut in it or a hole in it or you know someone at a museum throws paint at it you can do all your work in your studio but it's still now a damaged damaged goods right yeah. Yeah. um thank you for being here and representing this side of the conversation um, I know a lot of people are really interested to hear um, your 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 conservator angle, and it'll be great to uh, talk, discuss more. And then finally, I would like to present our special guest of the evening. Um, we have Scott Fortner of the Marilyn Monroe Collection joining us as a secret surprise guest. Hello, Scott. Um, Hello, I'm going to just go through your bio very quickly. Uh, Scott's a lifelong Marilyn Monroe enthusiast and collector of possession what is likely the world's largest private collection of Marilyn Monroe personal property. The owner of the, and founder of the Marilyn Monroe Collection website and his account on Instagram is Marilyn Monroe Collection. Pieces from the vast collection, which total hundreds of objects, have been exhibited around the world. Considered an authority on Monroe and memorabilia, he's often called upon by major auction companies to assist in authenticating and verifying her artifacts. Immediately following the 2022 Met Gala, Mr. Fortner was quoted extensively in global news articles regarding Ripley's loaning Kim Kardashian the gown. Uh, weeks later, he made global headlines again following his social media posts that confirmed the damage of the, of the historic gown, which we will look at. Uh, though he received requests from almost every media outlet for an interview, he saved this one for us. This is his first filmed interview on the subject. Uh, we're honored to have you here, Scott. Um, and uh, I'm going to, instead of showing a slide of your work, we're going to look at your work and, and we're going to turn to you to give some background on the dress. There was already a question of how it came to be at Ripley's and, oh gosh, you have all of that and more. Um, so let's start with this piece. Do you want to tell us what we're looking at here? Sure. Well, um, first of all, I want to say hello to everyone and how pleased and privileged I feel to be here, uh, particularly with such an esteemed organization and, and such an esteemed uh, panel of, of other uh, specialists in the area. So um, it's an honor for me. So thank you. Um, what we're looking at here is the original sketch for the happy birthday, Mr. President dress. And this design was actually created by Bob Mackey. Uh, it's a Jean-Louis gown based on a style of dress called the nude dress that he originally created for Marlene Dietrich to wear in her in her concerts in the 1950s. And so you can look this up if you weren't aware and see photos of Marlena Dietrich wearing similar styles of gowns, basically the nude fabric with the strategically placed rhinestones. Uh, and so again, the sketch was by Bob Mackey. And uh, Mackey, of course, has done many other famous works, uh, probably most famous being Cher. Uh, and if you're a child of the 70s like me, The Carol Burnett Show. So yes. what we have on the right, is an original swatch of fabric which is known as souffle uh, and it's a very um, uh, rare fabric it's not even made today so repairs to the dress using the original type of fabric are impossible because this this fabric isn't even made today but this swatch it's almost a you, type of chiffon silk is that correct exactly yes and it's actually and it's a little no bit stretchy 
Right. Okay, and it's no longer made today because some treatment makes it highly fallible. Correct. That's that's what's reported exactly. That's yes. the statement. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So this, sometimes all we have is the statement. Exactly. So this swatch of fabric was actually attached to the original sketch, and these are the original array of crystals uh, that you see here on this swatch uh, that was given to Marilyn with the sketch to give her an idea of what the dress would look like. And she actually gave this sketch with the swatch attached to her half sister Bernice. Uh, they kept it for several several years and then auctioned it off. But this is an original swatch of the original fabric uh, used for the gown. Scott, we're, we spell Sufl, S-O-U-F-L. Oh. S O U F F L E with the with the mark over it, I believe. Wonderful. Uh, yes. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, this is a piece from uh, from your collection on the left, and then something I found via Google on the right, which I don't know might be your collection also. I never asked you mm. that. Yeah. Walk us through what we're seeing here. Well, actually, I did a blog post about this showing this receipt. I wish I had this receipt, but I don't. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is the actual original receipt that verifies, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the cost of the dress uh, minus the cost of including the actual beading. And so what Marilyn paid for the dress was $1,440. I actually happen to own all of Marilyn's financial financial documents since 1962. And there's a line item in one of her statements for her expenses that clarifies she paid uh, $988.50 to a woman named Carmen Ramirez to install all of the crystals on the gown. And so the total that she paid for the dress was $2,128.83. So if we consider that with inflation today, the amount that that would be is $20,884. So if Marilyn were like today- I was literally today, going to my phone for a conversion yes. app. But yeah, amazing. Yeah. I mean, yes, that's a lot to pay for a gown for an event that you're asked to go and perform at. And then she, you said in your records you have a notation of her giving five thousand dollars for her ticket. Yes, Marilyn. Although she was the the final presenter and clearly the star of the show, she actually had to buy her own tickets to attend. So um, a little bit of irony there. But they did send her a jet to take her there. Is that right? Or did she pay for that too? I imagine she had to pay for that herself. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she had to pay for it herself. Yeah. On the right is an original invitation to the President Kennedy Gala from May 19th, 1962. Thank you. Um, uh, Liza is mentioned after the, uh, the spelling of the word. It's the same spelling as souffle. And let me tell you, when we began these conversations, I was pronouncing it souffle and um, was quickly corrected by the panel that it's souffle. So there you are. Um, yeah. This is one of the, well, I'll let you explain this. Right, so this is a photo of Marilyn prior to the Met Gala, um, excuse me, JFK Gala, <laughs> Freudian slip. Um, and yeah. so she's standing here in her elevator at her apartment in New York at 444 East 57th. There are very, very few color images of Marilyn from that night. This is one of the few color images and this is one of the best color photographs where we actually get a chance to see the color of the dress uh, from when she wore it, just sn sneaking out there from under her fur. Yes, because the material was swatched to be as close to skin tone as possible on her. Exactly, clothes. exactly, to give that nude effect. Adelaide Stevenson yeah, said when he saw her on stage, it was nothing but skin and beads. The, there you go. Um, yeah. And yeah, it, it, it made headlines that day it was worn, and it made headlines the maybe next time it was worn. the next exactly. time it was seen on a red carpet exactly. um these are three images here from the night um you know you can see a lot of context with the kennedys with her mm -hmm. doing her performance and with that lovely coat falling off her shoulder um the coat's nicer than the one kim wore in my opinion um but uh they're not i don't think as powerful as that color candid it was no. where she wasn't really expecting it correct People make a big deal um, out of this photo on the left of being the only photograph of Marilyn and, and John F. Kennedy together. There actually is at least, there are other photographs because there were several pictures that were taken at the Krim residence, which is the location of the reception following the gala on May 19th. And this just happens to be the most famous photo because it shows them close and talking. But there are actually other photos of Marilyn with, with President Kennedy from that night. 
are there Gina, are there images with her with him from other nights? Uh, these are the only photos known to exist of them together. Thank you. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about their relationship. So indeed. Uh, that was a, that was a question for me. Um, this is something that you introduced me to, which I was just um, really interesting. Uh, we talked about the, the dress being swatched to her skin. These are the shoes she wore. And tell mm -hmm. us about how they came to be in then the slide on the left. Sure. So in 1999, um, Anna Strasberg, who was Lee Strasberg's third wife, she put And Lee Strasberg was? Marilyn Monroe's acting coach, and she left the majority of her estate to Lee Strasberg uh, when she passed away in her will. So the Strasbergs acquired all of Marilyn's personal effects and belongings. Uh, I've spent quite a bit of time with Anna Strasberg, and she's shared many stories with me about what that was like. And I think one thing that's most surprising uh, that people probably don't realize because it's not something she's shared publicly is that Lee didn't even know that he was in the will. So it was quite surprising for him to learn that Marilyn had left all of her personal effects and belongings to him. And it was actually quite wow. some time before they took possession of her effects. So in 1999, she auctioned uh, a, a bulk of Marilyn's estate. And so what you see here are the shoes that were up for auction. Uh, these are the shoes that Marilyn wore. Uh, you can see that they have been dyed uh, pretty much the same color as the dress. And of course, this is the first auction where the dress sold. Uh, and at that time, it sold for about $1.24 million. And it was purchased by a private investor uh, who had it until it sold again in 2016. Uh, but these shoes were purchased by the Ferragamo company uh, because they are Ferragamo shoes. Marilyn had over 40 pairs of Ferragamos in her uh, possession when she passed away. And so it was pretty much a go-to look for her. It's just fascinating that these shoes weren't sold with the dress or with the coat or even sold as, on their own as and described as uh, the shoes she wore to the event. Do you think it was they were just kind of separated and they didn't know the provenance at the time? Or does yeah. this realized price of $32,000 think that maybe somebody did? Well, I think what I've, what I've come to discover is that Christie's, first of all, this was one of the very first celebrity auctions and the estimates were incredibly low. Uh, you can see here, the estimate for these shoes are twelve to $1,500. Um, so and that other, includes a clutch purse, and, just right. not shown in the images, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and so I think people didn't really have an idea of what some of these pieces would go for. I also know from people who have worked at Christie's that they had an awful lot of interns working on this auction. So if you had people who weren't necessarily Maryland fans or aficionados, they didn't necessarily know what they were looking at. And so I've come up with countless examples of, of things that were sold at Christie's that were not credited um, in such a way that really documented their importance or significance. And this is just the perfect example. It just says uh, a pair of flesh tone silk stilettos. It says nothing at all about the shoes yeah. that she wore uh, to President Kelly Kennedy's birthday gala. Yeah, we'll have to ask Deborah about this, but I'm pretty sure Christie's didn't form like a fashion textile category, which now is really dominated by handbags until or maybe 2006, 2008, but she might know exactly. So uh, during this auction, the dress sold for $1 million. That was a record One, at the time, correct? $1.24 million. It held the record as the most expensive dress ever sold at auction. The dress previous was Princess Diana's blue velvet gown that she wore when she danced with John Travolta at the White House. And then it beat its own record. Yes. So in, in so response to... Yep. In response to the prior question about how Ripley's came to acquire the dress, uh, Barbara Zwieg, Barbara Zwieg, who was the widow of Martin Zwieg, who purchased the dress in 1999, put it up for auction at Christie's and, uh, excuse me, Julian's in 2016. And this is where Ripley's bought it uh, for $4.8 million at Julian's in November of 2016. Uh, and this is the, uh, still the most expensive dress ever sold at auction. Uh, at significantly higher than what it sold for in 1999. Uh, yeah, a lot, four times the price almost. Right. Um, uh, Martha B has a question that is pertinent to this moment. Did Marilyn leave perhaps money to her therapist? 
Yeah, you know. she did. She did also leave money to to her therapist um, that was to be used for for charitable causes. So seventy five percent of Marilyn's estate was um, given to Lee Strasberg, along with all of her personal effects and belongings. She left money for the care of her mother. She left money for her half sister Bernice, uh, and then um, her therapist as well. Wonderful, thank you. So now we're getting to the slides that everyone well i don't know that yeah. that that brought this some mm, no i'm not gonna say anything we got right. the slide number 15 yeah. so i'm gonna invite the rest of our panelists to come up all right so on the picture of the left we see kim kardashian being fit to the dress in orlando you can see on the back that there are fabric Mm, ribbons stitched into the garment that couldn't have possibly damaged it right uh to because it wouldn't close then we see her as a fitting on the front which i believe is at the final dressing and then we see her during the met gala in the replica dress which clearly has much more stretch um in it um any preliminary thoughts Doug? i'll just clarify that the center photo is actually her trying on the dress immediately before the Met Gala in her dressing room that was um, staged for her <laughs> by by Ripley's. Yes, yes, that's what I meant to say, but you said it much more um, accurately. Well, I think, you know, we can't think of this, of anything but a kind of a publicity stunt, because if she has a replica dress that she wore for the rest of the night, I mean, why wear the dress at all? It's one thing to be a collector and, and think about collecting a dress like this. If you're you know, a private person such as Kim Kardashian who can afford to collect whatever she wants, but why wear the dress at all? She had a perfectly viable replica of it. So I, I mean, I can't think of it anything more than a stunt you know, to get the attention and to potentially increase the value of the dress. So I think it's also very interesting, Graham, that um, the dress had to be explained because Kim Kardashian is, you know, we're used to seeing her in very outlandish outfits, the, the kind of the pure runway, right off the runway, not kind of watered down later designs. Um, this dress, you know, she stepped out. It, this is not a shocking dress anymore. You know, these new dresses, we see them all the time. Kimberly just wrote a really fabulous article for the Washington Post about the new dress. I mean, it's it's not something that is what it was 60 years ago or even longer with uh, in the 50s with Marlena Dietrich wearing. So the fact that Kim Kardashian, you know, it had to be explained, there had to be some commentary that went along instead of her stepping out of her car, walking up that red carpet, and everybody just being wowed because Kim Kardashian looks so exotic or strange or avant-garde or whatever. It's another aspect of this dress which I couldn't quite understand is, you know, what was the point of wearing it except, I suppose, for shock value, but shock value that had to be explained. Well, and even the fact that she practically had to walk up the stairs sideways, um, it, it, none of it made any sense. And it also doesn't really fit the theme of the gala either. So it's just so out there and the hair dye and all of it is it's so attention grabbing. It's it's painful. She got the idea to wear this after the previous Met Gala before the theme had been announced. So it was not meant to go with the Gilded Glamour theme. But even the, you know, dyeing her hair and all of that is like she's trying to pay homage to Marilyn Monroe yet you know, just like Elise said, like, why couldn't you just wear a facsimile of the dress and pay homage that way and make it your, your own instead of trying to be something that you're not? Yeah. I think a dress made um, for her would have looked more like the Marilyn dress because this dress was so famously made for Marilyn. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, but wasn't she sewn into it? I mean, it was that good of a fit on Marilyn and it was matched to her skin tone. Uh, if Kim had worn something matched to her skin tone that actually made her look nude as Marilyn's dress did that we saw in the sketch and in the color photo, I mean, she was she looked like she was just wearing rhinestones. It did not have that effect on Kim Kardashian. Yeah, yeah. In response to that comment, I the question in my mind about Marilyn being sewn into the dress always goes back to why would she need to be sewn into the dress if it had a zipper and it was custom made for her? Um, so she, 
She stood naked while they cut the pattern around her body so that the dress would fit like a glove, which it did. And so I think one thing that's important to point out here is prior, after Marilyn wearing it, before it went to auction in 1999, there were repairs that were made to the dress. I mean, it's a, you know, decades old gown. And so you can see in photos areas that have been repaired. And I'm not convinced that she was sewn into the dress. It could be just an area that was repaired. Uh, and when you look at the stitching, if you see the photos, you know, those aren't the stitch. I'm not uh, an expert at sewing, but it appears to me like those aren't stitches that somebody could do while someone was wearing the dress. Um, so they're pretty uh, precise and exact. So I don't, I actually don't believe that she was sewn into it because it was made custom for her and it had a zipper. So it, it fit perfectly. I'm so glad like you clarified that because I've, I've always been a little skeptical of that too. Yeah. Of course, the other issue though is that the dress is much too long for Kim Kardashian, which yes. is why she had to wear those platform heels that made her walk up the stairs of the Met even scarier for all of us and yeah. for her too, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen Kim Kardashian naked and covered in crystals enough that it wouldn't even be shopping, shocking on the on the red carpet. So, yep. Um, You're about question. to see it again in the interview magazine that's coming out if you haven't seen that yet. Oh, those pictures are, I mean, we talk about this dye job. You should see the next one. Um, yeah, uh, there is a question from Kathleen that we actually as a group discussed a little bit earlier. Doesn't Anna Winter have to approve every dress worn on the red carpet at the Met Gala? That's what I've heard. She's the only person allegedly that knows what every single attendee will be wearing because she has to prove it in advance. And so if that's the case, you know, the curator of the Met Gala approved Kim Kardashian wearing Marilyn's dress. She certainly yeah, knew Met about it, whether she approved or not. The museum, sorry. Yeah. yeah, the museum right. had to know. They had, you know, a, a changing room at the bottom and a changing room at the top. And did Andrew Bolton never say this, you know, I'm going to lose my career over this. This is done. We can't do this. And then nobody, <laughs> nobody could stop the train of, of Kim Kardashian wearing it, I guess. Um, and guess when it has Anna Wintour's stamp of approval, if in fact it did. It's difficult to know what other people said behind closed doors. It's, it's a... It's a, it's a tricky conversation. Yes, the Met had to have known about it because they did provide changing rooms. Um, and supposedly Anna Wintour knows what's going to be worn. However, um, you know, it goes beyond even um, the aspect of who knew what at a given time, because as Kimberly mentioned, this is an idea that was long in the making. The conversations I had two months before the, the Met Gala so there was a lot of involved um, with it uh, being worn and a lot of people making decisions along the way. Um, why the Met would provide you know, a changing room? They may provide changing rooms for many of the high-end celebrities. Uh, and so that may not have been anything that was unusual. Um, uh, so the fact that this gown was privately owned versus in a public institution, again, gives it a lot more freedom of use. Uh, um, so there, there's many different layers here that go beyond just laying blame to one entity, one owner, one event that, that the dress showed up at. I want to point yep. out though, that one thing that happens every year on social media when the Met Gala happens uh, is that people say, all these rich people having a party, spending so much money, this is so immoral, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of criticism directed at this event every year uh, because it is so over the top, because people spend so much money, because they dress up. Uh, I always have been able to defend that by saying, yes, but it's for a good cause, to support historic fashion conservation, which it is. It is the Costume Institute's only fundraiser. They don't get any money from the Met. This is it for them. Uh, but this completely undermined that. One could argue that this dress is especially famous because Marilyn wore it when she did at the event she did and, um, you know, it made headlines at the time. If it was reworn by someone of equal fame, uh, is the legacy not carried on to another generation? And we could debate equal fame as much as we want, but... Um, you know, uh, Allison asked a question, what if she wore another Marilyn Monroe desk that wasn't like really significant? Maybe something that sold for only $100,000 at Christie's. 
it's all about media. Would we be having this discussion if Marilyn Monroe had not been filmed singing to the president, wearing that dress? As amazing as the event was, it was recorded for history. Right. So it, it's, it's this context that the dress accidentally uh, survived the time, the context that it was actually originally worn in has survived to us today. Think of how many incredibly famous buildings or dresses or whatever have come and gone because, and we did not know about them because they were not recorded. So therefore sure. they were incredibly famous at their time, but because it wasn't recorded, they're not discussed today. Uh, if Marilyn right. had not tragically died young, if Marilyn had lived to be 99 years old and she talked about this dress over and over, you know, would it be as tragic because she died so young and it kind of the height of her being, a, you know, a sex icon? Uh, it's context, context, context that, that places everything. The dress has now been placed in yet another context, a very famous event worn by a very famous person and recorded for people 60 years from now to continue to talk about. Yeah, and I was going to talk true. about, I, we raised the question of like of equal fame. And so that I think is really upsetting to people, um, the equal fame aspect. Um, you know, Marilyn lovers, Kim haters, I'm not going to get into that. But, um, uh, you know, we've just, it just seemed to upset people so much. Um, I think it, 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 it's, it's showing a mirror up to our society that people became incredibly uncomfortable with that, um, you know, money uh, will buy money and power and power of a polarizing maybe a Instagram figure or a social personality, um, uh, you know, gets, gets things that are outside anybody's, though the, certainly my colleagues uh, and the public's idea of something, we never thought something like this could happen. Um, I think there may have been a little of a break of trust um, with who got the, who buys these things. No one ever thought anybody would ever do that. So that that ceiling has been, you know, popped now. Who knows what's going to go on? Um, the idea of legacy is really interesting, and I think that the event undeniably raised the profile of the gown, um, and um, and you know brought this 60 year old story on uh, Kevin's right it's it's all of this it was captured on film it's 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 got all of these aspects and I'll talk later about these intangible uh, these properties that that infuse it with value for us as a as a, as a well, across the world um, but another 60 years from now in 2082 I do not think that him wearing it is going to uh, be part of the legacy of this dress. I think ultimately it's going to be it's going to be Maryland's dress. That is the important thing. I think this will be a footnote in in this this um, this dress's uh, long life. But I think eventually, I think it's going to settle. I think it's going to bring up important conversations like we're all having. Um, and I, I think that, you know, as a culturally defining moment, I think ultimately um, Maryland's, Maryland's use of it is just going to have a lot more staying power um, than, than Kim's. But for. I want to add that part, uh, yeah. Marilyn Monroe didn't just die young. She died young three months after she wore this at Madison Square Garden. Um, Kennedy died a year and a half later. So it, that is also part of the dress legacy. It, it, perhaps had they both lived, it would have a much different legacy, but they did it. Um, and I think too, regardless of whether this is going to remem be remembered as Marilyn's dress or Kim's dress, it sets a very bad precedent. Uh, curators already get asked all the time if people can borrow dresses for photo shoots or to wear. Uh, it's absolutely not allowed in an accredited museum context but people still ask constantly and I think they're going to ask more now because this has happened and it will make it easier for someone else to wear something equally. So on that note, on that yeah. note, let's talk about what ICOM said. Um, in light of recent events uh, where a dress that belonged to Marilyn Monroe was used by a celebrity in a public event, ICOM has been discussing this topic and I'd like to share the following statement. Historic garments should not be worn by anybody, public or private figures. Um, 
they mention a little bit more about that. Although the dress belongs to a private collection, the heritage must be understood as belonging to humanity, regardless of which institution has custody of the property. As museum professionals, we strongly recommend all museums to avoid lending historic garments to be worn, as they are artifacts of the material culture of its time, and they must be kept preserved for future generations. Any yeah. comments on that? Definitely. Um, I mean, what was coming to mind for me is, you know, Debbie Reynolds' costume collection, she collected and saved uh, a huge bounty of garments on productions she was in, and those have all gone to auction. So are we now in a situation where the public is going to see it permissible now that uh, we've got, you know, other historic dresses in private collections? out there and it's going to be okay to wear them which it's not. so i i'm gonna actually jump a question that um and just on that topic you, the vintage fashion world has exploded in the past 10 years um and there's various online markets and and more um more archival collectors and um, companies than ever before that sell, you know, extraordinarily rare couture, celebrity owned or celebrity worn pieces. How do we as, as professionals in this area not become like gatekeepers of who can and cannot buy these products <laughs> while continuing to encourage the enthusiasm of collecting archival pieces and developing these collections? And then also suss out what's museum worthy or truly valuable and what in fact could be a fun reusable item. I'll, I'll start, I, you know, something is not a museum object until it's in a museum. Uh, then As it's you were a museum saying earlier. Right, and you know, once, and if it's deaccessioned out of that collection, poof, it's not a museum object. You know, and it's each, each individual uh, institution has the abilities and, knowledge to take care of the collections the way they take care of them. There are many little historical societies all around uh, the United States that may not have the, 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 the funds to actually take care of very important, what we would consider very important garments um, or other antiques um, in, in ways that, you know, the Smithsonian, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, other institutions can that have more funds. Uh, but, but outside of that object being in a museum collection, it is owned by somebody and they can do anything they want with it. It is, we, we cannot police them. What we can do is educate as much as we can. Just like when the, I got that phone call and I was giving my opinion about why this dress should not be worn because of its delicacy, because it's you know very iconic, because of all those reasons that we've talked about already. However, we cannot police individuals um, that own things privately because we don't want our own objects policed. Um, and so, you know, Ripley's, yes, they own it because they had enough money. They were willing to spend that money. Did they did they buy it because and, and, and pull this stunt off because they wanted to do increase the value of this dress, supposedly, so that they can sell it and make a profit? Um, those are all legitimate things that they can do because they own the dress. They can cut the dress up and they could sell it bead by bead for 50 bucks a bead and make $10 billion. You know, I mean, that's the, 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 the sad thing for us, we that would care and understand that something needs to be preserved because we as museum professionals are always working into the future. Um, we're working on exhibitions in the future, catalogs for the future. We're, we're acquiring objects to, to preserve them for the future. Most people live in the present and what's ever in front of them, that's, what's, that's what they may care about. And then they move on and they, they, they move on to something else. And the importance thank you. is- well. Excuse me, I was gonna say thank, thank you, Kevin, for bringing that up. I mean, it's, it's, there's a bundle of rights. And when you put something up on the block, it doesn't come with a caveat where it has to go to an institution. It's going to limit who maybe could buy. And sometimes the people with the deepest pockets are, are private private people and you know independently funded institutions that are not museums and you're right they can do whatever they want about it um, they you know they did say that they wanted to maintain it for 300 or 400 or 500 years they are an amusement attraction um, which is a, a short turnover it's immediate in out um, you know uh, things go on display that it's 
cultural, you know, R2D2 and things like that. It, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a faster loop for things that are popular, popular culture. Um, and um, we can get into later about, yeah, how they bought it. But um, there's, yeah, Ripley's, Ripley's did exactly what they showed us they were going to do with it. Within a year of them buying it, the summer after they bought it, it was shown um, in Canada in six supermarkets. Um, for over about a course of eight days or nine days, is the CEO of Ripley's owns Save On Foods in Canada, and so it was it was doing a tour of Canadian supermarkets in opening in Saskatoon for his for Saskatoon, um, and so they showed us uh, in 2017 exactly how they were going to use it, which was to to drum up um, you know a PR for, from it. What what really angers um, me about that situation too is that they did not display it as Marilyn's dress or Jean Louis's dress or the Kennedy dress. They displayed it as the world's most expensive dress, and it was the most expensive dress because they're the ones who set the price for it when they bought it. Uh, so they they did not buy it with the intention of celebrating the design or celebrating the woman who wore it, but with showing off something very pricey that they had a hand in in making pricey. Um, I, I uh, would add too that the uh, there are private collectors, and I'm sure Elise would agree, uh, and celebrity collectors who essentially run small museums and have curators and have storage facilities that are up to museum standards. So just because something's in a private collection doesn't mean it's treated badly. It can be treated very well or even better than some museums treat their objects. Uh, so I don't think private collectors are bad, and I and this is hardly the first celebrity to wear a vintage dress on the red carpet. We've seen Renee Zellweger, Julia Roberts, uh, Demi Moore, uh, wear vintage Winona Ryder. Uh, there's a long history of doing this, uh, but they, they are not necessarily these iconic pieces of historical importance. They are beautiful vintage dresses, which it is absolutely fine to wear and alter. Uh, it's in fact very sustainable to do so. Uh, designers lend out pieces from their private archives because nobody wants to show up in the same dress as someone else. I think one of the things to consider about this particular situation, too, is that a dress that has gone on this sort of grand tour of grocery stores um, was actually a, an even more fragile, unstable dress to be a candidate for being worn, because I'm sure, you know, however it was mounted and unmounted and traveling and ha the handling of it just increased the mechanical stress to the dress. So by the time it's coming to Kim Kardashian, it's already fatigued from this, you know, more recent use of the dress. Um, right there, I'm going to pivot to this image, uh, which we see the dress on the left behind two people taking selfies. And then the advert says, come see the dress worn by Kim Kardashian. And then at the bottom, it says the world's most expensive dress. This comes back to an audience question for Scott. Can you talk about the mounting of this dress um, and has it stayed on this mannequin the whole time? Was it transported to the Met Gala on this mannequin, et cetera? Ripley's in their own press releases said that the dress had never been taken off of the dress form. Um, and it was shipped in basically a box where the the, the dress form was was put into the box and it was padded and then um, flown to wherever it was going to be displayed or, or exhibited or whatnot. But um, the dress was custom made for the gown. You can see the knee bend, uh, which mimics uh, a photo of Marilyn, uh, where she had her knee bent the same way. This was also done in order to provide support for the bottom of the gown uh, while it was on display. But Ripley's themselves said it had never been off of this dress form until it was removed for Kim Kardashian to wear it. What are some other garments of such magnitude and how do we know how they are being preserved and publicly utilized? Question part one, part two, are there other garments out there uh, of this weight that are lost or not given the attention they should be? Uh, what can we do about that? And maybe something for each of you to answer very briefly, what garment would you love to recover or see um, uh, May either mounted for display or preserved in a way that it can, you know, be available upon request for researchers, scholars to look at it in perpetuum. So I remember I made a post about this one time and, I, and someone from Europe came back and said, you know, stupid, silly Americans, you think that you, you know, are the most important in the world when there are 
dresses, you know, from the royal family that are hundreds and hundreds of years old. And so, so I think it's important to obviously remember that, you know, this isn't the only dress in the world. <laughs> um, yeah, true. Yeah. I mean, in 2017, I, you know, saw Queen Elizabeth's christening dress, her coronation dress, her wedding dress, you know, all of these important dresses throughout her career. But, you know, they only do that like once every 10 years or something, and they are being right. preserved by the Royal Trust. Right. Anybody right. else have a garment they would to think is ranks up there? Huh. I think well, you know, Smithsonian has a great collection in the all of the first ladies dresses. Those are, you know, very important to our particular cultural history. But yes, uh, the, the royal dress collections of many families around the globe in different cultures. There's so many. I mean, I think we can't simply focus on celebrity um, and, you know, Hollywood. Um, there's a lot of important dresses. And I think, you know, more so in Hollywood, I think of the designers themselves than the people who wear them. There's yeah, the, the one yeah. dress that we, we've all seen that survives, but we will never see in our lifetimes, which is Jackie Kennedy's pink suit, uh, which is in the National Archives. It's preserved. It's embargoed until 2103, 100 years after it was given to the National Archives. But even then, the family will have the final say on whether it is ever displayed. Uh, we all know the dress. It's one of the most famous garments ever ever worn, and I don't see anybody demanding that we let it out of storage and put it on display. To clarify, this is the Shea Ninon model of a Chanel raspberry pink suit that Jacqueline Kennedy wore on November 22nd, uh, the day of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Equally as famous, connected to the Kennedys, uh, is her iconic wedding gown. Uh, which has been displayed in a very respectful way at um, the Kennedy Library, is still owned by the Kennedy family. And, you know, is something that is um, become even more important, seen as more important because of the, the woman who made the dress, designed the dress, and Lowe, and the work that's being done on designers of color to bring uh, them kind of out from the shadows and make their work well known the Kennedy dress being one of the most important of the mid 20th century, right around the time of um, Jackie Kennedy and, and the Kennedys and so forth. So here, here is a gown that I, I think many people would recognize and has been copied multiple times because of the person who wore it. We can't get away from celebrity culture. There's no way, the, the royals feed on celebrity culture. Um, you know, it's something- And our celebrity culture. And they are celebrity culture. And again, it's because the celebrities are recorded. I'm not photographed every single day and people don't care what I wear. Therefore, I'm not gonna have much influence, but there are people like Marilyn and Jackie Kennedy who were, and, and that's why we love to talk about this so much and, and see their, their dresses and get upset if we perceive that somebody has kind of gone past the line of respect. So, we talked about it so much. You can't get away from celebrity culture. I'm gonna do that right now. We're gonna to pivot to some museology and scholarly questions um, uh, because I know we could talk forever about the celebrity side, but um, you know, we brought these lovely panelists together because they all have a, a lovely, a unique lens on the topic. Um, Knowing that there are so many mission purposes for collections, such as preservation, teaching, exhibition, and outreach, what is the best way to promote and use items that are too fragile or too valuable to be handled or exhibited so they don't just don't stay in a box forever out of the light of day? Or is that the only option? I think there's multiple ways that you can address that. I mean, you can obviously address that digitally and with your database and um, you know, having your objects accessible to the public via, you know, a database on your website or whatever. But if you have, um, like, even public programs where you can bring out objects and you handle them or you don't handle them and have supportive mounts that maybe these things live in in storage that you can bring them out and show to people. But um, generally, we don't let the public handle our objects in museums because we are the trained individuals and we are there to teach and we can show them and teach them how but um i think by using these methods it gives them an opportunity to still see these things even if they don't maybe come out for exhibit or you know come out very often at all i mean um we yeah. had one of, one of my last 
jobs, we had some of Alexander Hamilton's epaulets that never would see the light of day. And, you know, it was always the thing people wanted to see because Hamilton and, you know, people are like, you know, I've got to see something that was that was on his body. And um, so, you know, every once in a while we would bring them out. But and of course, people want to touch them and they say, do you try them on? You know, things like that. But we have to maintain you know, our professionalism and our code of ethics as well and say, no, we do not. This is how we handle them or we don't handle them. And I think that that's usually satisfactory with um, with the public. Yeah. yeah, I know in the fine art world, you know, I toured the tombs at the Met under Central Park um, in college and there are boxes and boxes of drawings and etchings and uh, and lithographs that are too fragile to ever be removed from here to, to, to even like lift them and move them and it's like well th they're just buried I guess like they they're literally in their coffin now and it is so sad to see the names on them of like you know Degas and Picasso and this and that and you know for whatever reason the cheap typer they used or you know some 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 deterrent in the ink that's um, they're just crumbling to death in these boxes, and and nothing can, nothing will be done about it. Well, I think that's why it's important that you know, uh, photo documentation, the digitization of collections, um, occasionally what is known as visible storage, um, where there's no handling of things, but you can see them. But you know it's maintaining the documentation around collections because yes, a lot of things are going to continue to deteriorate and degrade and not be stable enough to be handled, but making replicas. I mean, I've seen some great fashion exhibits where they've replicated all the undergarments. So you know how that dress was fitted over the body by seeing what was underneath. And, and that's really, you know, a great educational aspect of fashion design is, you know, how is the form? What's the cut? What's the, how is the pattern made? All of these things that contribute to what you see when somebody does wear a dress. But I think we can avoid putting garments and objects and museum collections or other collections in danger by providing other ways of viewing them and seeing them. I think also some museums have study collections that allow you to handle things that may be similar to what's in the collection, but could be the, you know, the condition could be not as as good to maintain um, in the the regular collection. So they're deaccessioned for students to, to study or people to handle just to get a feel. Or even facsimiles um, can be made or used to teach um, about you know similar like like items in collections. Yeah. Um, yeah, even curators think, you know, don't get to handle pieces in their collections any more than necessary. Um, sure. And I think I think we also you know have responsibility to be upfront with the public about why we can't do that, about uh, you know why there are gaps in the collection, why things are fragile, why they don't survive. I think we tend to rely on smoke and mirrors to make everything look brand new and complete. Uh, when it's really not. And I, I think museums have a responsibility to educate the public about the realities of what these collections are, where they came from, what condition they're in, um, and, you know, kind of sh shine a light on that work and, and on the very re real, you know, budget and staff and time shortages, too, that, that make it impossible. Yeah, that everybody faces, large or small. You know, safely. Yeah. So I have a question for Deborah, and then our last question will go to Elise. Um, Deborah, uh, how do you go about appraising the insurance value or fair market value of such a dress? Did the Met appearance increase or decrease its value? And does the reported damage decrease its value? Yeah, so insurance versus fair market value. I'm just, I'm going to go with insurance because this is what, um, and there, there are different values. So, um, uh, so firstly, I would approach it uh, slowly, steadily, uh, methodically, and with no madness. So just sort of like I appraise everything, it's just, it's, it's another dress. You go through all of these, um, just sort of a checklist. Um, and and um, uh, so first of all, we have the type of value we're looking for, which is insurance purposes, and that's replacement value. How much would it be to replace this gown? Uh, and, and it's irreplaceable. Um, so in fact, what we're also trying to figure out is how much money would you need if you had to buy a comparable type 
down at the same level. Um, or something as you know, important. Something, something as important. Yeah, and you sort of sort of document what the different aspects are that that uh, you know Kevin was alluding to. Um, it's it's uh, you know it's Hollywood, it's Maryland, it's JFK, it's political, it's 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 a, a it appeals time to of, a myriad of. of yeah, it, yeah, but sort of, each of all those things, it's really, it's a very, this clarity on exactly what make this dress up and the values that impact it. Um, so after I do that, um, and then an appraiser, this is kind of, it, it's pretty methodically, pretty methodical, we then have to look at three different approaches to value. So you've got the type of value you're dealing with, which is replacement value. And then there are three ways uh, appraise, uh, approaches of coming to that value. One is called the cost appraisal and a uh, cost approach. And the cost approach is how much would it be to make something anew? It's not gonna work for this gown because yeah. you can make it new, but the, the value is in this intangible stuff. It's not that it's a Jean-Louis gown. It's all the other stuff around it. So that one, that is not gonna And you work can't get Sufil anymore. You can't get so for even a good souffle. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> and we know there's a replica. So be ready for the replica to come up uh, on the market. Just just ready. Um, do we know there's only one replica? I don't know. Um, uh, the next one is called the market approach. And personal property appraisers often go to a market approach. It's, um, you look at the market. What else is sold kind of like this? Well, you're gonna go hop back to your list. Kind of like this. Well, it's a seven year, Seven year itch dress, uh, the, the white dress that flies up when she's in the, the, the subway grate. Um, and that sold in 2011 for $4.6 million. Okay, we've got checklists, we've got Marilyn, we've got Hollywood, we've got a great dress, we have a documented uh, sale and an open auction. Okay, that's one. Um, we've got this dress, what this sold of last time. Okay, um, a third, the third one, which is different, is the Eliza Doolittle dress. Um, um, uh, in My Fair Lady, where she goes to Ascot. It's a black and white, it's a great gown. It sold for 4.4, again, in 2011. It's different, it's up there, the market reacted to it. Again, I'm watching what the market's reacting to it. We've got five years difference between the two, so it doesn't like it happened all the same year, like someone was grabbing things, there was a fury, so we've got some time between them. Um, um, uh, but And then there's the income to, approach. And then there's the income approach. And the income approach is what I think probably um, is probably going to work best for something like this because it's a stream of, of income. It's a, an av it's, a, it's a revenue a maker for the buyer. And I think uh, it's probably what, um, what Ripley's is referring to when they say it's worth 10 million. I don't know how they came up with that. I don't have any colleagues who were ever who were approached, any colleagues that do costumes or Hollywood collectibles or anything to do with Marilyn that were approached to be the appraiser. When Ripley was saying, we talked to conservators, we talked to curators, we talked to appraisers. I don't know who they talked to, um, but the income works for them. Um, if they are able to figure out, I don't know, they've collected that information of how many people went in the front door between May and now. Um, and oh, they have appraisers. to know it. They're in a music yeah, they, they have all that data. Right. Yeah, they have a yeah, turnstile. They, they sell tickets. They do. they do. They can say, oh, I'm here to see, you know, that that big pinup, uh, believe it or not, Kim, let's just say, believe it or not, Kim wore this. Um, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> but... Um, it's shocking, uh, but that for that type of thing, I would actually work with a with a business appraiser um, because sure. there are there are elements that it's a business aspect and, and we dovetail a lot, um, and that's sure. an absolutely valued value. That is a, a valid way to to do an appraisal for insurance purposes because so you know, how would you then, future. Yeah, exactly. Uh, income, right? Um, yeah. How would you then discuss? Do you think Kim's? Uh, Yes or no? Do you think Kim's wearing the dress increased or decreased the value, or do you think it's not made a difference? It's fair market speaking. If it were to yes, come to two, two aspects of it. Two aspects. I think that, um, given from what I'm hearing, her last, her last, um, uh, the last sale of it would probably be um, an entry. It would be going north of that. Um, uh, there are private sales, there are private people talking, um, you know, um, maybe, maybe people are going to get together and buy it to save it. Uh, maybe that's what we're dealing with. I, you know, I, I don't know that maybe we've got that kind of a group, a group action 
Um, but um, uh, her wearing it is not devaluing it the way the public thinks of it. The public has talked about it sort of sullying um, her legacy. I don't deal with selling a legacy. I deal with like right. what is what are the people who are really going to buy it that do they in fact it's still working the same way it worked in 2011 and 1999 it is displayable it's intact in 2016 2016 excuse me 2016 not 2011 it's you know the right lighting does wonders um, in terms of lighting and, and covering things. Um, you know, we, we have a hard time tracking um, condition unless you match up and you look at all the condition reports. When something sells at auction, there's a condition report that is prepared and if you ask for it, you can get it. Really important buyers, people are really serious, will go and look at it themselves. Um, and then once it's sold, that condition report is no longer available. The next time it comes up for, for sale, you if you had that condition report from the previous year, great, but no one's going to give it to you. You are presented with the property again. You have no idea what it looked like, what it may have changed. Um, and so it's hard to track where that, so it becomes a, a new property. With yeah, its a lot of, a lot of uh, shady stuff can happen in the back room or the storage facilities or things like that. You know, we never know if... Somebody else might have tried this dress on well, or if out, someone dropped it on the, the floor market. or something like that. Yeah, they're out in the market. You know, the minute they're born, it's sort of deteriorration. It just it yeah. just starts and we try to, you know, try to stop that. Um, um, what was the other question? Oh, the damage. Did the damage uh, affect the value? So I think my, you answered that. I think you said that well, cosmetically it will still display properly and it shouldn't really have a major... At, at, yeah, Vermont, what I've seen professionally is that something at this level of the market, the there it where it's unique property, there is a lot of leeway when it comes to damage. They don't expect a brand, you know, a perfect condition, um, and they're so happy to to have it available. They're going to take. I know I, I haven't seen people back off. The 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 buyers would deal with a, a, a fair bit of of bumps and dents in a in a unique piece sure yeah. so that, and they, they, repair it. they don't like it they they would try to repair it or support it in some way it's not and they would send it to a lease probably at least like do you. you get you get historic objects brought to you after someone has acquired them for for repair yeah, um, restoration stabilization yeah so i mean our clientele is is small museums, institutions, university collections, plenty of private people in the private sector. So things come to us from all over. We just recently were working on three historic opera costumes. It's the 100th anniversary of the San Francisco Opera and um, they're preparing those to go on display. And of the five garments that came to us, um, I pretty much said only two of them could go on display. The other three were just absolutely not in a condition to be put on display. And I had to basically say no. <laughs> um, we have a process similar to what Deborah described. And when we have a project arrive at the studios, we have a whole onboarding process, which is photo documentation, um, very detailed condition reports of all our observations of an object or a garment, um, and then a process of creating a temporary housing for that object while it's in our studios. So if it's coming to or from, our working tables, um, it has a safe place to go in, in between steps. Um, but for any garment like this, I mean, you know, our, our first and foremost intent is to stabilize an object. We're, we're not trying to make repairs that are, um, uh, you know, a restoration quality of work. We're really looking to just preserve the dress, stabilize, uh, an object or garment, um, and whether that is hand-sewn repairs or other sort of newfangled higher science conservation approaches using materials like Bevatex or Lasco welding powder, you know, there are many different approaches we can take and whether we clean to remove stains in an aqueous way or we choose to do a non-aqueous approach, you know, there's there are many things that go into a thought process 
um, which includes creating some mock-ups um, to decide, you know, how well will this work with this fabric or this other fabric or the dye here, what do we need to do? So, you know, before even approaching the actual object, we're going to put them through some scenarios to make a good decision about how we're approaching it. And, um, and then even when you get into a treatment, you may find that you're like halfway in and it works in one area of an object, but it's not working at all for you in another part of the same object. And so then you have to reevaluate and come up with a treatment plan that will work for this other section. Um, and of course, there's always previous repairs to deal with. Do we keep the previous repair? Do we undo it and make it better? Um, how important is that to the structural integrity of a garment? Um, you know, mechanical stresses, hanging stress, you know, it also depends on what these fibers are. It, there's so many variables. And, you know, I like to tell my interns and staff, you know, every single object that comes here is its own individual problem to solve. And um, we have certainly um, a rigorous way of making sure we're careful and, and safe with objects in the studio. But, you know, garments like this, I can imagine have perspiration stains and body odor impregnated in a, you know, a synthetic, um, and this is a silk kind of synthetic mix, this souffle material. So I imagine that there are a lot of problems to solve in, in dealing with the zipper where it got pulled and is kind of torn out on the sides where the eyelet hooks were super stress points. Um, so, you know, we just have to always um, look at you know, what are the best options. The most abbreviated way that you can, if this garment came to you for restoration, either by its current owners or a future owner, What's one thing you would do? What's the one question you would ask? And what's one thing you wouldn't touch? Just because we literally have four minutes left. Okay. Well, I certainly wouldn't uh, try to wet clean this dress or, or do any stain removal with it. I might try to consolidate any of the beadwork that is loose and uh, has sprung okay. threads and needs to make sure it's uh, stably attached. Uh, but the you would replace beads with random beads. No, no, I wouldn't replace okay. any beads. I would just make sure that the ones that are remaining uh, don't fall off. Um, and then the back area where the hook and eyes are have just you know totally split open the fabric. If there was a, a a safe way to get behind that in between the attachment of the zipper and the lining and and put some kind of you know silk crepeline dyed to match behind it and just some couching stitches to hold that in place and stabilize those tears. Um, and then, you know, just making sure that it has, you know, maybe a foss shape uh, bodice so that it's when it's laying in a, a blue box or in a storage um, housing that it's, you know, well supported with an inert material. Yeah, I believe it stays on the mannequin if it's even... Uh, yeah, which is not term. a good idea for that dress long term. That's a lot of weight, stress, and, and you know, even if it's a custom form-fitting mannequin, it shouldn't, you know, not only to talk about light and particulate matter um, and the environment in which it's standing out there in that mannequin, but that it really should be properly um, housed. So I want to thank our panelists, our esteemed panelists, our special surprise guest, Scott Fortner. I want to thank everybody at the Custom Side of America who helped make this possible and make it free for everyone. And on that note, I would encourage anyone viewing to make a kind donation to the Custom Society of America so we can continue to put this information out and these this content out for free that's all folks um, I, I thank you all for your time this was a really wonderful panel i'm so honored to be involved myself and um i feel like i have six new uh fashion detective buddies to to, to solve future uh mysteries with so thank you all so much and have a wonderful night